Hello everyone, welcome to the second series of the FAG online seminars. My name is Marco Bortoleto, I'm a member of the FAG Education Commission, and today the talk will be Understanding Forces in Gymnastics. And for this opportunity, I'm very happy to introduce you Mr. Ludwig Schweizer. Welcome Ludwig, join us, please. Good morning, a nice afternoon, or good evening to everyone from whichever time zone you are watching from now on. Hello, Marco, nice to meet you. Hi, Ludwig. It's a really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you to join us. And uh, if I don't, re if I remember well, the last time we have been together, it was in Rio 2016 in, at the Olympics. Did you remember that? Oh, of course I remember. It was a tough but wonderful time. Exactly. I, I think it, it was a very, very intensive moment. And the result we got at the Olympics was an amazing opportunity. So Ludwig, if you don't mind, I would like to introduce you uh, a little bit for our audience. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Go on. My dear friends, Mr. Ludwig Schweizer is a professor at the Freiburg University in Germany, and more specifically at the Sports Science Department. He dedicated years and years as a director of the Gene Lab, testing and developing technologies, apparatus in gymnastics, having a very close relation with different suppliers and manufacturers. Ludwig was member of the FAG Apparatus Commission for many years and he was responsible for testing and certificate the apparatus during many world championships and also summer Olympic games. And uh, recently, in more, more precise, in 2008, Ludwig was recognized for the Hall of Fame in gymnastics in the United States, showing how important is his work for the gymnastics. So Ludwig, once again, thank you very much to be with us. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Marco, for this very praiseworthy introduction of me. I am very pleased to be able to contribute to the series of Academy events now. And I would la like to thank the FIG and the Academy, of course, very, very much for this. So Ludwig, I uh, would you like to give the floor to you and after that, I think we'll have some time to have a very short conversation about this talk. Thank you, and please feel free to start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Let's go on. Dear coaches, forces are a mechanical phenomenon that we constantly encounter in everyday life. Also in the various disciplines of gymnastics, a deeper knowledge about the effects of forces helps to better understand movement sequences and to make training more effective and targeted. That is why I want to focus on this today for the next 35 minutes. I have stru structured my presentation as follows. After an explanation of what we need to know in this seminar as a definition for forces in gymnastics, I would like to briefly talk about important features of forces before I then report a meaningful division into external and internal forces. As fourth point, I will explain the dimension in which forces are measured. In concrete biomechanical measurements in gymnastics, the peak forces are noticeable. However, these peak forces can only be classified correctly if you think a little bit about biomechanical load and stress in gym gymnastics. At the end of this presentation, I would like to focus on a few measures to reduce peak forces and biomechanical stress in gymnastics. But let us start with the question, what are forces? Forces are all causes for change in shape or the change or tendency to change in the state of movement. 
Here you can see in slow motion the enormous movements of a springboard during the takeoff to the vault. The cause of this change of movement is, according to our definition above, force. With iron cross nothing moves. At least that should be the case if the judge shall give the full score. Anyone who has ever tried this difficult holding skill on the rings knows that you can only succeed here if the forces acting on the rings are in certain balance. Therefore, the acting forces have at least the tendency to change the state of movement. With this definition, we can look at a special property of forces, in which the physicist Newton formulated more than 300 years ago as follows. If a body A acts on a body B with force F, B attacks A with the same force, minus F, but in the opposite direction. The force with which this gymnast deforms the bars during her grip leads to a counterforce which ultimately redirects her movement to the desired turnaround on the uneven bars. The forces with which the gymnast deforms the vaulting board, as previously seen in more detail in slow motion, cause a reaction in the form of the forces that provoke the necessary flight phases during vaulting. When landing after a dismount, we see the deformation of the mat, but important are the reaction forces that slow down the gymnast from his fast falling movement to a still stand. This interaction principle, which Newton formulated in his third law, is perhaps known to many under the keywords actio, reactio, even if one has no deeper knowledge of elementary physics or mechanics. If we take a closer look at the forces relevant in gymnastics in the following, a division into external and internal forces makes sense. If we consider forces inside the body, we speak of internal forces. Accordingly, we summarize all forces outside the body as external forces. Here are some examples. At first, we should speak about gravity. Gravity is an external force. Its effect is often particularly unpleasant at the balance beam when it leads to an unintentional interruption of the exercise. The muscle power of a coach who supports the execution of exercises during training is also an external force. The hanging and supporting reactions of the different gymnastic apparatuses affect the gymnast from outside and are therefore external forces. If we plot the direction of the forces as shown here as lines, we can see that large hanging and supporting reaction forces to the front and to the back are generated before a dismount at the high bar. Therefore, this apparatus must be tensioned by ropes. For the grip, for example, at high bar, a special effort is necessary in gymnastics to avoid injuries of the palms. The resulting frictional forces are external forces. Now to some examples of internal forces. The passive resistance forces of the different tissues of our body, such as our bones, ligaments and tendons, enable us to react equally to external action forces. Normally, the strength of these tissues is sufficient for generating internal resistance forces. If, however, the external forces are too great, the bone will unfortunately break or the ligaments or tendons will tear, resulting 
in a more or less serious injury to the athlete. An object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity, unless acted upon by a force. In the literature this is often referred to as Newton's first law. For the second case we have here a good example at the dismount. The upper body of the gymnast tries to keep the movement given by the fall even after the landing contact. This creates an internal inertial force and the effect of which I think was clearly visible here in the video clip. However, the most important internal force is our own muscle power, with which gymnasts, in contrast to immobile and solid bodies, can perform various movements of our sport. Now that we have a certain idea of the force effects in gymnastics, I would like to explain to you in which units forces are usually measured. Forces are measured in honor of the natural scientist Isaac Newton in Newtons. To give you a rough idea, one Newton is roughly the weight force with which a mass of 100 grams is pulled to the ground. For example, a gymnast with a mass of 70 kilograms will have a weight force of 700 newtons. In many biomechanical studies it is very useful to compare the acting forces as a multiple of the body weight. With this trick, the light female gymnasts and the somewhat heavier men have the same relative weight force of 1 g when standing completely still on the ground. Then let us take a look at how high the maximum forces in gymnastics movements actually are. We must, first of all, keep in mind that during the fast movements in gymnastics, the occurring forces are never constant. Depending on the dynamics of the movement, they can reach very high peaks. We should consider a few examples of this. Here we see the time course of the forces that occur to, for the left and the right leg when we jump on the spot. At the beginning, when holding out in the starting position, the curves do not move yet. Half of the body weight is displayed on each side. After a very slight backswing, the signal increases to about twice the body weight when generating the takeoff forces. During the flight phase, there are of course no reaction forces on the ground. However, immediately after landing, there are high force peaks of about five to six times the body weight. The high peaks that occur so quickly after contact, even at such low jumping heights, are typical or landing on unpadded floors without mats. If we simulate much higher impact heights corresponding to landings after a dismount in gymnastics by drop jumps on 20 cm thick Phi-G approved landing mats, we get an impression of the peak forces that occur here. With low landings for example at the pommel horse or at women's vault, peak forces of four to six times the body weight are to be expected. For high bar landings, where the center of mass with very good gymnasts reaches a height of more than four meters and thus a fall distance of more than three meters, we have measured peak forces between six and almost 16 g with different gymnasts and landing mats. I should also point out that all peaks are reached in less than 50 milliseconds after the initial mat contact. We know from simultaneous measurements of muscle activity that the muscle tension cannot be adjusted arbitrarily in such a short period of time. This requires a pronounced pretension in preparation for landing 
without which the high forces cannot be counteracted appropriately. We have measured the forces for all participants that occur at the vault between the hands and the voting table at the first official world championships where, voting table, where the voting table was used. This was in Ghent 2001. By the way, more recent measurements have confirmed these old values. We have here the force curves for the classic frontal handspring on the left of the women and on the right for the men. The upper line of the red area marks the average course, that is, the mean values curve. The two red and blue, mark, uh, blue marked areas, uh, they mark the tube in which, into which plus minus one standard deviation, that is approximately 66% of all volts fall. The average peak for women is over 2 Gs. The men who reach with higher energy from the approach to the voting table even reach on average about three times their body weight. We observe higher forces on the high bar. In the classic giants, this gymnast has to hold on to the bar with about 3000 newtons. If he starts with a power giant swing to this mount, he even produces two peaks, the second of which is 4000 newtons, and this is 5.9 times the body weight. Even higher peaks can be reached by gymnasts at the rings. Although all well-known equipment manufacturers no, now use damping elements in the ring suspension, in the meantime, uh, this light Chinese, Chinese reached a value of 4,320 newtons during this swing to handstand. This was 6.8 g for him. At the 2010 World Championships in Rotterdam, we measured almost all of the complete exercises on the rings, a total of 238 exercises. On average, peaks above 5G appear more than seven times per exercise. The highest peak force that we registered was 10G. As a rough summary, we may note for occurring peak forces, still standing 1G. Barefoot landing on solid ground for, with a drop height of 25 centimeters, 5 to 6G. Landing on gymnastic mats with a fall for the center of gravity of 200 centimeters, 4 to 6G. Landing on the mat from 250 centimeters, 5 to 12 G, and with a high, uh, with a high bar dismounts with center of gravity falls of about 300 centimeters, 6 to 16 G. Push off of the hands at the vault with, for the females, 1.5 to 3 Gs. Same with the male gymnasts, 1.8 to 4.5 G. Giant swings at high bar, 4 to 7 G. Rings swing to handstand, something between 5 to 10 G. If we land on a floor after a somersault forward, 8 to 12 G. And with somersault backwards, even up to 30 G. If we now ask ourselves, what influences the level of these four peaks, measured as multiples of the body weight? The following aspects are responsible. The skill itself, this is predetermined and nothing can be changed as a coach. Hardness and damping of the equipment. Here I am thinking above all of the best possible mats, which should guarantee optimal damping with their given height, for example, during landing. 
The training condition and physical abilities of our athletes play an important role. And finally, I have to mention the technique of movement. For example, hard or soft landings, which we can observe after dismounts. In the following chapter, I will add an important aspect to our considerations on forces and explain why it is important from a biomechanical point of view to distinguish clearly between load and stress. For this purpose, I will use a very model-like presentation after Powell's from 1965, which will probably be shown once in every biomechanical, biomechanics lecture course. Imagine a lower leg on which a force acts centrally from above. In such a case, the effect would be an evenly distributed pressure situation in the loaded bone. Now we move this force to one side and let it act on the lower leg outside the central line. We will now create a completely different stress in the bone with high pressure on the right side. Towards the middle this pressure will decrease continuously to a neutral point and finally on the left side even a tensile stress will be created. So we get a completely different situation inside the bone. We know that bone tissue is more, much more resilient under pressure than under tension. That is why a bone normally breaks under a too high eccentric load at first on the tension side as indicated here. Therefore, we should always keep in mind that if we change the point of attack and the direction, we get completely different stress inside the body with probably the same external load. The example just explained may have been somewhat simplistic, but we should think of the daily practice in the gym, where sometimes our gymnasts resume training after, after a survived leg injury. Often we overlook unilateral landings of the gymnast who want to spare their previously injured leg. Here it is important, and this is my proposal to the coaches, that they change their observation perspective and observe the gymnast from the front or the back. At the end of my presentation I would like to present three selected examples of how to better identify movement techniques with regard to what I mentioned in both chapters 5 and 6. Nothing is more pleasing in gymnastics than a perfectly stuck landing. Judges want to see a landing without additional step or compensation movement. Under the aspect of biomechanical load and stress, we can add some additional consideration here. Ideally, the gymnast should have intercepted the landing with equilateral loading up to the knee angle bent by about 90 degrees. If he is forced to go to a low squatting position, the stresses in the, in the knees joint increase significantly despite a possible equal external load. We should therefore avoid such an end position as far as possible, quite apart from the fact that it becomes much more difficult to remain standing still in the following. Fortunately, we never see the following variant with top gymnasts, but very often in the low level. I think it is not necessary to explain here that due to missing interception in the knee angle, higher peak forces appear, which due to this overextended posture at the moment of contact with the ground additionally leads to high stress in the lumbar region of the spine. In contrast to the previous two variants, we can see landing position positions on the top level, 
with their upper body strongly tilted forward quite often. These landing movements are especially typical after previous incomplete backward rotations. When the body is bent forward, it is much more difficult to use the muscles around the knee joint effectively for the braking movement. As a result, these landings are often relatively stiff regarding the knee flexion. Biomechanical measurements show significantly higher peak forces, especially after incomplete backward rotations, than, for example, landings after forward rotations. But higher peak forces are not the only remarkable aspect of such landings. We already got to know the movement of the upper body when we talked about internal and external forces. Immediately after ground contact with, in this case, very, very stiff knees, the resulting inertial forces move the upper body further towards the ground. What is special here is that the inertial force is to be applied at the center of gravity of the upper body and the effect of the braking forces along the legs lie on different lines of action. As a result, a typical shear situation arises which places an extremely unfavorable load on the lumbar region of the spain. For this reason, these landings with previous un incomplete backward rotation must be regarded as highly stressful and it would be desirable, in my view, if this were to be taken into account more clearly than before in the judge's evaluation of exercises or dismounts. In the next example, I want to look at the inlocate at the rings. The inlocate is an elementary skill and is therefore already practiced in the basic training with young gymnasts. We will discuss the force effects on the so-called acromioclavicular joint in the shoulders, a joint located between the clavicle and the acromion. Many male gymnasts in their later career suffer from typical pain in this joint which is often caused by degenerative changes in the acromioclavicular joint with inflammation and swelling of soft tissues or bursitis even at a young age. Now we look at the biomechanical load and stress in two main phases of the movement. We measure the highest forces around the swinging below the ring suspension. Despite, despite the high load, the stresses in the acromioclavicular joint are acceptable because they are combined with an anatomically favorable posture. During inlocation, the external forces are comparatively low. We only measure one tenth of the load from before in, on average. But if we estimate the stress on the acromioclavicular joint by means of biomechanical model calculations, we can find a relative high tension stress. The lower the shoulders are positioned during the inlocation, the higher the stresses are. Therefore, my demand to the coaches is uh, if at a young age the condition and technique are not yet fully developed so that this skill can only perform, be performed with flexible and deep shoulders, the coach should make sure by appropriate assistance that the shoulders can take a higher position. By the way, another solution may be possible, but this is, would be probably only for Indian people. It was a smaller gag inside the last slide. In my last example, I, would cons I will consider peak forces and stress at the scaphoid. 
a carpal bone during different arm and hand positions. The carpal bones are eight small bones that make up the wrist that connects the hand to the forearm. Stress at the carpal bones is correlated with the arm and hand position. My images refer to the support phase at work, but similar considerations also apply on the floor, for example for flick flack. In a previous slide I've already shown that peak forces of 1000 newtons on average occur in the support for women and 2000 newtons for men. In extreme cases we would even measure 1750 for the women and 3400 newtons for the men. For frontal vaults the unrotated arms with extended hands are normally used. However, there are always athletes who touch the surface of the vaulting table with outwards rotated arms with extended hands tilted towards the little fingers, a so-called ulnar adduction, as you can see in the right, at the right side. This outwards rotated arms severely restricts the mobility of the elbow joints. You can easily convince yourself by this of this by trying to perform simple push-ups on the floor with your arms rotated outwards. It is very hard. With an unrotated or even inward rotated arm this is much easier. In our case, of course, this is the real reason why the individual athletes involuntarily choose this arm position. They want to achieve the highest possible second flight phase with a stiffer impact from the voting table. However, this superficial advantage comes at the price of considerably higher peak forces and thus higher loads on the elbows. And at the wrists? We should take a closer look at this. Here you can see the wrist with the mentioned eight carpal bones. Especially important for us are the scaphoid and maybe the capitate. We are interested in the stress on the scaphoid with extended hands tilted towards the little fingers, the ulnar adduction. A study to this question was able to prove via model calculations for ulnar adduction that a in ulnar adduction the only carpal bone that exerts a force on the scaphoid is the capitate bone and b in ulnar adduction higher forces than in the other hand positions are transferred to a small area of the scaphoid through the capitate bone this gives evidence to the remark of a medical, medical working group. The scaphoid is the most mobile but the most frequently broken carpal bone, especially in young, active people. We now know that it is almost exclusively the capitate that has, to, that has a punctiform load on the scaphoid in a hand posture as described above and that mainly the scaphoid will break under too much stress. By the way, I read in an old German article where a broken scaphoid was called a gymnast's break. When assessing biomechanical load and stress on the scaphoid, I would always recommend to avoid outwards rotated arms with extended hands tilted towards the little fingers and instead prefer inward rotated arms with extended hands tilted towards the, top, the thumbs. In the unwanted first case there will be the higher force peak and the hand position will put additional stress on the scaphoid. The variant with inwardly turned arms and hands produced significantly lower peak forces and subsequently lower stress at the elbows and for the scaphoid. Dear listeners, this brings me to the end of my short presentation on understanding forces in gymnastics. 
in which I first explained what forces are. We got knowledge of Newton's law of action and reaction as special features of forces, and then I divided into external and internal forces. We learned about the dimensions in which forces are measured and then saw the peak forces occurring in exemplary situations in gymnastics. I then went on to discuss the important distinction between biomechanical load and stress. At the end we got to know three examples for the reduction of peak forces and biomechanical, biomechanical stress in gymnastics. I hope I have managed to create a deeper understanding knowledge about the effects of forces. It will make me very happy if my presentation helps to understand movement sequences better and to make your training more effective and targeted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ludwig. It was amazing. And I'm no doubt that this topic is really important for the entire gymnastics community. I hope all the gymnastics coaches and everybody in very in, interested in gymnastics have the opportunity to follow your presentation. So we still have a few minutes and I would like to uh, ask you very, uh, two important questions in my opinion, if you don't mind. Please go on. Well, firstly, I would like to ask you, uh, what can be done to prevent endurance in gymnastics? Well, I would say there are three things which are essential from my point of view. First of all, I think it's very essential that the athletes had a good physical preparation before they start to tra the training with a big skill or a big, uh, for a big event. First part. Second, I would say it is uh, essential for coaches that they have a very deep and profound knowledge about the movements they want to teach to their athletes. I'm not a fan of uh, try and error during the training in the gym. Uh, it should be well prepared. And as I said, uh, the knowledge of the coaches is very essential. And the third thing I think is, uh, of course, we should use the best possible apparatuses, uh, mainly and above all, the landing mats. That is a good help for the athletes to prevent injuries. Well, I know that this is not always easy in all countries all over the world, but we should try to do our best. Yes, definitely. Uh, to use the adequate equipment uh, can help a lot. And, and I think this is an important uh, goal to the future for all federations, all clubs in gymnastics to be the best they can to provide the better condition as possible. So Ludwig, considering your long experience in this field, developing technology, developing apparatus. Uh, do you have any suggestions co uh, concerning the development of new apparatus and thinking about the future? Well, I think um, there are also some hints for the manufacturers in this, in this case. My, my main message to manufacturers is uh, always uh, since a lot of years, they should try to keep the moving parts at the apparatuses as light as possible. Of course, that is not uh, possible in every case and uh, we have always some compromises. Compromise uh, should be during the balance beam. Uh, balance beam is a relative stiff equipment and uh, it would be, of course, it would be much better if it is more soft damping elements within the beam. But uh, well, knowing that uh, if it is moving too much and it is, if it is uh, damping too much, then it is very difficult for the girls to, to keep their equilibrium. So uh, it is a compromise between these two things, a little bit like at the floor, at the floor, the compromise is we should have a good 
uh, elastic properties for the takeoff. That is what athletes mainly want to have. They want to have triple and maybe uh, quadruple somersaults <laughs> once a day. But on the other side, they have to land after these skills. And to land, we need a lot of damping, not too much vibration. And this is something which is in a contradiction to the things which I said at the beginning. And this to find this compromise, that's the challenge for the manufacturers. Uh, but I think uh, with, which, uh, with uh, new artificial material, uh, there are good chances in the future to, to solve these problems. It's really a big challenge. I hope you, your colleagues, uh, keep working in, in this direction, trying to develop technology in favor of gymnastics to guarantee safety, but also to guarantee the show. Uh, I, I have no doubt about how much technology have been developing in the last decades. And I hope all the suppliers, the manufacturers, and also the researchers involved in this field could work together and join the ideas and the proposals to make gymnastics even more great. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Ludwig, thank you very much for your participation. We are very happy to have you with us and I hope we, we find another opportunity to keep talking and to keep exchanging our uh, good thinkings about gymnastics. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And uh, thank you to everyone, of course, Marco. Uh, all the best and try to stay healthy. Goodbye. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.